business members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly. The next item of business today is the Members' Business Debate on Motion No. 10901 in the name of Jackie Bailey on absence of suitable hospice and respite facilities for young disabled adults. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I would be grateful if those members who wish to speak in the debate could press the request to speak buttons as soon as possible, please. I call on Jackie Bailey to open the debate, maximum seven minutes. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I'm very pleased to be able to bring this debate to the Parliament this evening. I know that Robert Watson, who's the chair of the CHAS Young Adult Council, was hoping to be here tonight. Um, if he has made it, um, a very warm welcome indeed. But Robert is a young man with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. This is a life-limiting condition, and he and others in the Young Adult Council set up, set up the What About Us group and lodged a petition in the Parliament calling for age-appropriate respite care facilities. Robert, together with Kyle Kelly, presented that petition to the Public Petitions Committee in November 2013, and I know made quite some impression on the committee members. But I have to confess, presiding officer, our timing was truly terrible, because it happened to be the same day as the launch of the Scottish Government's white paper on independence, and you would think that the Scottish Government would have held off for a day or two so that we had some of the publicity, but you know, they didn't do it, I don't know why. But the upshot was that adult respite didn't get as much attention as we believe it deserved, but I have to say to the Minister, we're not giving up. And I am grateful to members for staying behind tonight to participate in the debate. And let me be clear, because there was much banter across the chamber in the previous debate, I am working hand in glove with Jim Eady and Jackson Carlaw, um, together with Robert and his team, to make progress on age-appropriate respite care. Now, members of the CHAS Young Adult Council all suffer from different life-limiting conditions. Many would not have been expected to live beyond childhood, but such are the advances in medicine that people are living much longer, well into their 30s and 40s, and I'm sure beyond that. That's a really positive story and one that we should celebrate. But it does, however, bring with it a challenge. Many members in this chamber are aware of the exceptional work that CHAS do at their hospices in Balloch, that's Robin House, and at Rachel House in Kinross. They're set up to provide much needed respite for children with terminal illnesses. And what fantastic places they are too. Such is the pressure on their services though, that they had to take a decision to limit their respite care to those under 21 years of age. This will affect, they reckon, about 40 young people, but other estimates put it at 100 young people who will need to find alternative respite provision. But whatever the number is, we do need to do something about this. And whilst I recognise it is very helpful that there is to be a three-year transition period, I think it's clear that actually that's quite a short time scale to identify suitable alternative care. Let me touch for a moment on what would be appropriate, because this isn't about respite care for parents and carers, important though that may be. This is about respite care for the young men and women who, just like the rest of us, need to have a holiday, need to get away, need to be with others of their own age group. Now, we know that being at home can be quite isolating. And let's face it, we could all do with a break. But for many of these adults, it is a chance to socialise with others and their parents can relax, safe in the knowledge that the respite provider has the expertise to deal with their son or daughter's very complex condition. For those of you who have visited CHAS, you will know 
that it's not a sad place. It's filled with laughter and joy. There is always something going on, things to do, people to see, places to chill in. Now imagine you're an adult, age 21 or over, and your respite care is provided in an old people's care home or in the wing of a hospital. And that is the reality for some younger adults. And it simply is not good enough. And that's not to denigrate old people's care homes or indeed hospitals, but frankly, respite care provided in these settings is more about where there is space rather than being determined by the needs of the individual. What we need are respite facilities that are age appropriate. We need a chance for 21 to 45 year olds or 50 year olds, but far be it for me to suggest a model but you know, this works and local authorities and health boards have worked with CHAS to develop a funding model and process that has wider application. Now I know there's been discussion with Lukey House about converting an existing building to provide appropriate respite. I know the Prince and Princess of Wales Hospice in Glasgow were at one stage looking at developing new facilities of which bespoke respite for this age group could be part. So there is no end to the talent, the creativity of people in the voluntary sector wanting to help because they above all recognise the challenge of transition. But I also recognise that the Scottish Government um, thinks there is an issue here too. Their own Living and Dying Well Progress report, published in March 2012, reported on transition services and said that in many boards there appears to be a work in progress. Now, I'm sure the Minister would agree with me, it's a recurrent comment, um, where actually it probably exposes the lack of adult services for young people to transition to. And it would appear that the position hasn't really improved. The Muscular Dystrophy Campaign commissioned a survey on hospice and respite facilities for young adults, and this is what they found. 85% strongly or very strongly agreed that respite and hospice facilities were vital for my family's quality of life. 92%, a staggering number, reported limits to respite and hospice provision in their local area. 93% said that if respite or hospice facilities were withdrawn, the impact, and I quote, would be terrible. So we can be in no doubt about how important this is. CHAS has commissioned research, helpfully funded by the Scottish Government, to identify the number of children and young people that would benefit from palliative care, and that is welcome. Other research will look at end-of-life clinical problems and the impact that that has on families and services, and that is welcome too. So I recognise there is some activity, but equally I'm impatient and I think we all recognise the clock is ticking. So we need someone to pull this together, to drive the discussion forward, to arrive at a positive solution. And I can think of no one better than the Minister himself. He has the skills, he has the understanding to transform adult respite and transition services. Yes, I'm being charming because I want something. Um, and I ask him tonight, to recognise that this issue is not just about party politics. We all recognise there is a need to do something. So I ask him to commit this evening to personally taking that work forward. He will enjoy the support across party, across this parliament, if he does so. Because, you know, we have an opportunity to lead the way in Scotland, to bring providers and young people together, to develop a national response to the difficulties they face as they get older. It is a small group of adults but it's a growing number of adults with complex and exceptional health needs. And I hope the Minister tonight says yes, because we can do better, and with the Minister's help, we will do better. Thank you. Many thanks. There are a number of members who wish to participate this evening, so could I ask members to keep to the four minutes, please? Jim Eady, to be followed by Rhoda Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I congratulate Jackie Bailey on securing this important debate and for bringing the issue of age-appropriate respite services for young disabled adults before the Chamber this evening. This issue affects the lives of young men with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, people with other types of muscular dystrophy and neuromuscular and other rare conditions. So it is right that we debate this issue. 
I would like to place on record my own thanks to my constituent, Mark Chapman, who has Duchesne and who is an inspiration to me and a role model for young people with the condition, as well as thanking John Miller, the Scottish advocate for Action Duchesne and the Muscular Dystrophy Campaign itself for all that they do to highlight the need for proper support and care packages, investment in research, as well as the specific issues which are the subject of this debate. We should all remember that the work they do has made an incalculable difference to improving the lives of people with muscular dystrophy, their families and carers. But most of all, I would like to pay tribute to Robert Watson, who has been the driving force behind the What About Us campaign. As Jackie Bailey set out in her speech, the issue is that improvements in care and advances in medical knowledge and healthcare technology are such that life expectancy is increasing for people with these rare conditions. Action Duchenne have highlighted the fact that the standards of care have improved. People are beginning to live much longer than they would previously have done. And over the last 15 years, the adult population of people living in Scotland with Duchenne has almost tripled from 18 in 1999 to 55 in 2013. Robert Watson set out the challenge for politicians and decision makers alike in his petition, which has been signed by over 2,000 people. This is a significant achievement and testament to the strength of feeling which he and others have on this issue. Robert, in his eloquent and hard-hitting speech to the petitions committee, stated, I bet most of you in this room had a holiday this year, a chance to go somewhere different or to a place that you enjoy visiting for a break from the usual routine and stresses of everyday life. That is what a respite break is like for us. How would you feel if you were told that you could never have a holiday again? That is the reality that people such as me and our families who care for us face. Respite breaks are the only type of holiday that a lot of us can go on, so to lose the benefits that they bring would be devastating. Chas, whose headquarters is in my constituency, have set out in a briefing to MSPs the reasons why it is no longer appropriate for them to provide respite services to young adults and the steps they are taking to ensure there is a sufficient period of time to transition to new arrangements rather than simply pulling the plug on the existing respite services. Robert Watson has set out why appropriate respite services are so vital, not just for young disabled adults, but for their families and for their carers. And I was struck by what Robert had to say about the benefits of respite services as a chance to have a break from his parents and the normal routine which is set by the time when the care workers are due to come in. I was also struck by what he had to say in relation to being able to socialise with other people of his own age group who have the same or similar conditions and how vital it is that he and his peer group have the opportunity to meet up and to share their experiences. Robert reminded us, having spoken with young people aged between 21 and 45, and I quote, it is clear that all over the UK there are absolutely no respite services to support those of us who have lived into adulthood, not just in Scotland. Once we turn 21, or in some areas 18, we can no longer attend children's respite services, and because there are no suitable adult respite services for us to move on to, our families are left to cope without a break and with no support. Presiding officer, that situation is not acceptable. In summing up the debate, I know the skillful, understanding and dynamic minister, like Jackie Bailey, I too, want something will want to address the calls to action issued by the Muscular Dystrophy Campaign, in particular how the Scottish Government can perform a leadership role in facilitating joint working between health boards, local authorities and charities to provide long-term security for respite services for young disabled adults and to develop an appropriate funding model which will underpin those services. I conclude with a final quote from Robert Watson. Hopefully, with the help of the Scottish Government, Scotland can lead the way in creating these much-needed services for people with long-term complex conditions. I certainly hope that will be the case, and I am delighted to add my voice in Parliament to the What About Us campaign and to bring about the progress which this group of young people and their families surely deserve. Thank you very much. I now call Rhoda Grant to be followed by Jackson Carlo. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I too want to congratulate Jackie Bailey on bringing forward this debate. I think we all recognise how difficult it is um, the transition from child to adult services, and we hear about this in the Health Committee on a weekly basis. Um, it's very difficult with chronic conditions where um, the help, the support, and indeed the care you received sometimes stops altogether once you, you move um, from child to adult services. And this is even worse for those with life limiting conditions where every day is precious and where they were used to maybe um, additional support. 
um, while, while they were in those services provided for young people. Because those services look at the whole person. They provide routine, they provide education, so socialisation, and indeed are family-centred, taking in the whole family um, and provide a focus and, and support for, for everybody, including the young person involved. The contrast with adult services couldn't be more stark. In many places, um, th those services are almost non-existent. Existence. To have days that offer fulfilment and social interaction are, kind of, are, are thoughts that can never be fulfilled to many people. The opportunities to un undertake learning, um, education and indeed access to jobs um, are a dream. Some organisations are very good at providing those opportunities, but we really need to do an awful lot more um, to provide young adults with the, the lives that they want to live, albeit th those lives are maybe shorter, then surely they should be more fulfilling as well. Hospital services are also very, very different between child and adult services. Adult services tend to be at the very end of life and not providing the ability to allow someone to live their lives. So we need to look at how we provide hospice services for young people with, uh, with life-limiting uh, conditions. Respite as well. A number of members have already spoken about this, but I have heard from constituents who say that young people's respite is either at home or indeed in old people's homes, and that is really um, not appropriate for young people who actually need to go out and socialise and meet other people of their own age. This debate is not about keeping young people in children's services, but actually improving adult services and making sure that we offer people age-appropriate services. I've also been dealing with a number of carers who, uh, whose children have grown to adulthood, and they themselves have huge worries. They're an ageing population, and when they are maybe not at their full strength, they're being asked to do more and more. When they do receive respite, and sometimes that is a rare occasion, it's often to deal with family crises. Uh, one constituent told me about her annual respite being used to deal with her own bereavement of a parent. Another told me that she used um, the respite um, to deal with her own, own illness, and her, 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 child or young, her child was taken in um, to respite to allow her into hospital, but part of her uh, recovery was supposedly rest. However, there was no respite. She had to leave hospital, supposedly at rest, but take care of um, her, her, her child, who was um, now a young person, but needed constant care and attention and indeed some heavy lifting. That is surely not good enough, not, not for the carer and not for the young person. We need to do better, and I would add, add my voice to those of others here tonight to say, let's do something about this. Many thanks. Jackson Carlaw to be followed by Linda Fabiani. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, can I associate myself immediately with everything that Jackie Bailey, Jim Eady and Rhoda Grant have had to say on this issue? And I won't repeat it, and my contribution will be brief. It's been a tremendous privilege to work with those who are wor working in support of those with Duchenne's disease, the volunteers, the families, the young men themselves who are now so able to represent the future for themselves and have done so in this parliament. Uh, to have visited the children's hospice facilities where the only form of respite for many who a generation ago's prognosis was not one of surviving into adulthood is now available. And of course we can see as they survive into adulthood how inappropriate that form of respite is for those young men. Nor is it appropriate simply to ask them to sit with elderly people in an old folks home we need to have a facility which is appropriate to them and to their needs. I only want to say this. These are young men who are full of love, who are capable of being loving. These are young men who are full of passion, who are capable of being passionate. These are young men full of interests, who are capable of expressing those interests and being interesting. These are young men who are informed, who are capable of informing others. These are young men who are friendly, who now wish to be able to spend time with friends. What Jackie Bailey has asked of the minister is what a minister in the last parliament did in a cross-party campaign led by Trish Godman on wheelchairs, where the, the facilities we were providing belong to a completely different era and age. We now have young men surviving into adulthood. What we need is cross-party support led 
with the same love, passion, interest and commitment from government. And I hope that the Minister will give a lead to that and a voice to that and that Robert Watson's campaign and all he has sought to represent and achieve is something this Parliament can point to and say we have done. Many thanks. I now call Linda Fabiani to be followed by Anne McTaggart. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And of course, I associate myself too with everything that has been said. And I'm glad that Jackie Bailey has brought this debate to the Chamber. I'm so glad that Robert Watson and colleagues in the Muscular Dystrophy Campaign has raised it. And it, it is a huge issue. Uh, Jackson Carlo um, enunciated it very well there. I came to this issue particularly because of a constituency case when someone's father um, came to see me about it. And I must admit I was pretty ignorant about the facts here. I didn't know um, much about what was happening with Chaz, and that's a bit of what I want to concentrate on. I know there's a much wider issue here about respite breaks um, for people transitioning into adulthood, but I would, would like to use my time to concentrate very much on the circumstances of those who are finding that following the transition period with children's hospice that they can no longer go there for respite. So I, I think it's a really big deal. Um, the upper age of 21 has now been set, and I totally get uh, why this has been, been set. I understand it. But it's interesting when you look at Chaz's evidence um, that the service users having identified themes as being particularly important at transition stage to enable them to live life to the full. And the main ones that jumped out for me for the experiences that I heard from my constituent were social connections and short breaks. And Jackson Carlaw was talking about some of that. We're talking here about people who have now been going to Chaz all their lives and suddenly find out that in a very short time this, hasn't, this isn't going to happen anymore. So there's relationships which they've formed over all the years of their lives that they want to keep up with. Now, that's not an issue for people who are fortunate enough that they can get about on their own and have a huge degree of personal independence. We form relationships and we keep these relationships going. But when you're not what we call able-bodied and you aren't able to get out and about completely independently, this becomes very difficult. And this is where the respite is so important. And people gravitate to others with shared experiences and similar experiences, and they want to keep that up. And Chaz um, has estimated they currently support 41 young people over the age of 21 in their families. So I would like to think of these young people as a specific group at the moment who are going to find their lives and their relationships very, very changed by this particular policy. And that was why, just over a year ago, having learned about this, I did write various letters uh, to people about it and, and got the facts. And I wrote to um, the Cabinet Secretary, in fact, uh, for Health and Wellbeing about it. And when I looked out these letters again, there was something that re really struck me that I'd actually put it in the letter at the time. And this was about the lad in East Kilbride. And what his father said to me was that his son had come to think of Chaz as a second home. But it's the next bit. And said, he feels that he has been penalised for living too long. Now... We can all say, oh, that's not true. Everybody's trying really hard. Of course they are. But if that's how that boy feels, I think we have a responsibility to try and take that feeling away. And I see that time's uh, running out here. If that's OK, Presiding Officer. Briefly, please, Jackie Bailey. The member accept that Chas didn't choose to do this, but actually Healthcare Improvement Scotland required it of them, and they currently have a variation in their registration to allow them to take up to 21. Linda Fabiani. Yes, I would hate to have given the impression, if I did, that Chas were acting in some way badly. I don't mean that at all. What I would like to finish with, presiding officer, is back to the fact that this is only 41 young people here. I think we can separate them out, the bigger argument, which is about, yes, we need these services. And surely, surely, health boards across the country, 
local authorities across the country, those who have the responsibility for the well-being of their citizens, along with the health minister, can come up with some solution that allows these relationships to be maintained while we are looking for better services in the round for everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anne McTaggart to be followed by Nanette Milne. Thank you, President Officer, and I would like to thank Jackie Bailey for securing um, this important members' debate this evening. The development of appropriate respite services for young adults as an ongoing matter, which is of great concern to many of my constituents in Glasgow. Let me from the outset put on record my admiration for the dedication of carers throughout Scotland and the outstanding work they achieve on a daily basis and let us recognise how important it is that we do everything in our power to find solutions to problems when and as they arise because we as a county owe a huge debt to their devotion. As a member of the Public Petitions Committee, I have been involved in the progress of the petition lodged by Robert Wilson on behalf of CHAS and the Young Adult Council, and what a wonderful presentation it surely was. The pe petition itself calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish go Government to work with charities to help create suitable respite facilities to younger disabled adults aged between 21 and 45 with life-shortening conditions. Together, the Parliament and Government should be working with other hospices and care providers to see how we can provide facilities for young adults or committing funds towards creating new purpose-built facilities to support this group. Robert Watson and Kyle Kelly at the committee spoke about the need for respite facilities appropriate for younger adults with severe physical disabilities. They brought to the committee's attention the need of these facilities for both carers and younger adults. I had the pleasure of being invited to a joint visit along with constituency MSP Jackie Bailey and my colleague Siobhan McMahon to visit the Robin House Children's Hospice in Balloch. The work they do for young people is amazingly wonderful and to be congratulated. A constituent of mine who had been to Lukey House recently, who equally do a wonderful job, had not enjoyed the experience due to the fact that they were younger than the age group that was receiving the respite there at the time. As Ro Robert Watson said, there is a gap in the respite available for younger adults. That is a huge concern because one of the main parts of the respite is about getting together to socialise with your friends and peers. I share the view that the provision of the respite should be a positive experience for both the carer and the younger adult. Carers and those who receive care both need breaks from the routine. As Robert pointed out, for the carer, respite is a chance for them to relax, recharge their batteries and generally take a break. Likewise, for the young adults, respite care allows for a change from the everyday living. The positive effects of respite care should not be restricted to families of those who are under 21 and over 45. In conclusion, presiding officer, it is my hope that across this parliament, we all should continue with the Scottish Government to close the gap left behind by the CHAS's policy change and support the creation of respite facilities geared towards young adults. I hope that this, the Minister will concentrate his efforts to working with the charities, hospices and the care providers in order to coordinate resources and create a solution to this gap for young adults with disabilities. Thank you. I now call Nanette Millen, who will be followed by Jane Baxter. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In thanking Jackie Bailey for bringing this debate before Parliament, I'd also like to acknowledge her tireless efforts to help and support people in Scotland living with muscular dystrophy, not least through the Parliament's cross-party group for this condition. I'm a relative newcomer to the group, and I've been greatly impressed by its practical discussions led by Jackie and the can-do attitude of the group's members in trying to improve services for young men with Duchenne muscular dystrophy and for people with other types of muscle-wasting disorders. 
The What About Us campaign on hospice and respite facilities driven by Robert Watson has served to highlight a really important issue for many young people with disabilities who find that once they become adults, there's really nowhere for them to go if they and their parents or carers want a break from their normal routine and an opportunity to socialise with people of their own age group who have similar problems. There are currently around 100 young adults and their families in Scotland in this situation, and that number will undoubtedly increase over the years. But as Robert said in his powerful speech to the Public Petitions Committee, there are no services for people in our age group, nothing but the CHAS service for children and hospices for older adults who are mainly suffering from cancer or other terminal illnesses. It seems that as life expectancy increases, the support that is available to us decreases. He concludes by pointing out that respite breaks enable his parents to continue their caring role in the long term. Without these breaks, he said, it would become too difficult for my parents to care for me and it would cost the government a lot of money to provide 24-7 care for me. We all know the truth of Robert's words, but we also know that inadequate access to respite care is just one of the many difficulties faced by young people with severe disabilities and life-limiting conditions as they move from children's to adult services, not least barriers to accessing suitable facilities due to local authority funding policies because respite care for young people with high levels of need is very expensive to provide. The issue of suitable respite provision for young adults has, of course, been brought into sharp focus by the decision of CHAS to phase out its service for young adults over the age of 21. And if new provision is to be in place before this happens, there is an urgent need for the Scottish Government, health boards, local authorities and the third sector to get together to find a way through the difficulties. With a small number of people involved in each council area, it's clear that dedicated local facilities would be impossible to finance and sustain, and a national solution would require cooperation and complex negotiations over access and finance. Hopefully this might be facilitated by the ongoing development of health and social care integration. A one-size-fits-all solution is unlikely to succeed, and a range of person-centred options may well be what's needed for the disparate population who need appropriate respite provision. As discussed by Mark Hazelwood, the Chief Executive of the Scottish Partnership for Palliative Care, there may be differences in preference as well as need, for example, between respite provision at a dedicated centre or being supported to access a mainstream holiday facility. And the latter brings to my mind once again the excellent provision at Crathy Holidays in Upper Side, in my own region, where there are excellent facilities to cater for people with a whole range of minor or serious disabilities, as well as able-bodied people looking to have a relaxing holiday in a beautiful part of the world. The current debate, of course, is only needed because of the successful treatment of conditions like Duchenne muscular dystrophy, which allows many more people to survive into adult life. But the need for respite provision for young adults is now urgent, and I do hope the government will accept that this has to be a partnership effort and will bring together stakeholders, including the young people themselves, from right across Scotland to thrash out the difficulties and develop the solutions required to deal with a growing problem, which is only going to get worse if action isn't taken soon. So I commend Jackie Bailey, Robert Watson, and all those who have worked so hard to raise the profile of this urgent need, and I hope it won't be too long before they achieve the results they're seeking. Thank you. Many thanks. Uh, before I call Jane Baxter, I have to advise the Chamber that due to the number of members who still wish to contribute to the debate, I'm minded to accept a motion from Jackie Bailey under Rule 8.14.3 that the debate be extended by up to 30 minutes. Could I propose that motion accordingly? You could indeed. Is Parliament agreed? We are. I now call Jane Baxter to be followed by Graeme Day. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd like to join others in congratulating my colleague Jackie Bailey on securing this debate and on the important work that she continues to do on this issue. The subject of today's debate is extremely important and I'd like to start by paying tribute in particular to Robert Watson and to Kyle Kelly and the other young people involved in the What About Us campaign. I was moved by Robert Watson's evidence to the Petitions Committee when he told members a little bit of what respite care meant to him. And he said, I can get up when I want, go to bed when I want, and get a shower when I want, without that being set by the time when the care workers are due to come in. That's something that we take for granted. It's something that all of us do every day. And yet, it's, 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 we do take it for granted, but it's not something that, that people um, with muscular dystrophy um, can do independently. Um, 
And it's just little things like that, that that make you step back and think, gosh, this is really very important and it's something I don't think about enough and it's something that we have to consider very seriously. And of course, it's not just the young people to whom having access to quality respite care matters. It's their families, many of whom will be full-time carers. As others have said, um, I've heard first-hand accounts from parents of the stress that caring for the grown-up children can cause and the importance to all involved of getting a break. The Muscular Dystrophy Campaign has found that 93% of relevant people said the withdrawal of respite services in their area would have a terrible impact on their lives. The reasons behind the situation that is the subject of this debate, the absence of suitable hospi hospice and respite care, are in some ways good reasons. Improved health care means that more and more people with life-limiting conditions are living much longer than it was ever envisaged they would. But planning how they and their families will be able to get the breaks they need has not kept up with this. Instead, available respite care is often targeted at children or at older people, not the people that it is appropriate for you to spend your break with if you're a young man or woman. Our job in this Parliament is therefore to help ensure that these young people have access to the facilities and resources to ensure that they can live life to the fullest possible extent. This has got to mean age-appropriate respite care. Rachel House in Kinross, my region, is one of the CHAS hospices which has to reduce the age range of people it looks after. Rachel House does fantastic work and I have nothing but respect and admiration for the staff who do such a good job there. The work of Rachel House is transformative for the young people and their families who are supported there. But I question whether it should always fall to charities to provide these essentials. CHAS currently has to raise over £9 million each year to provide, to provide its hospice services, on which over 300 families across Scotland depend. The Health Minister will know that I have been critical of health services in my area and continue to be so. Health boards have a crucial role to play in addressing this problem, but tonight I am going to match the charm and persuasive skills of Jackie Bailey and Jim Eady and just ask nicely um, whether the Minister, in his contribution at the end, could say what discussions he's had with health boards and with other stakeholders in seeking to find a solution to this situation. Secondly, could he share with us the government's thinking on what suitable alternative provision could be established? Thank you. Many thanks. I now call Graham Day to be followed by Siobhan McMahon. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I, as others have, congratulate Jackie Bailey on bringing forward this motion? Uh, this is a subject matter which, as we have heard from the contributions tonight, from right across the chamber, rises above party political tribalism. It also transcends the funding blame game so often played out in the political arena. The simple fact is that addressing this hugely important issue requires government, central and local, and the NHS to come together and do the right thing. Um, and in responding to the challenge uh, before them, they must, more than anything, I think, listen to the views of the young people at the very centre of the situation. For respite and hospice, hospice provision must be shaped to meet the needs of those requiring it. The presiding officer, this isn't an easy subject. Anticipating lives being cut tragically short is, on the one level, a cause for sadness. And yet the fact we are required to address it also offers hope, because the reason we are having to consider appropriate hospice and respite care for young disabled adults is because many Many more young, uh, such youngsters are living longer into adulthood. In the case of Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, for example, as we've heard, that can be into the 20s, the 30s, even 40s. And it is utterly inappropriate that young men with this condition face respite provision, which effectively sticks them in an old folks' home environment. Just as catering for young adults in this sort of age bracket in the chas type setting really doesn't meet their needs, providing respite in traditional adult settings isn't what's needed either. Like others participating in this debate, I attended the event here in Parliament back in June, sponsored by Jackson Carlow and hosted by uh, Action Duchesne, to highlight the needs of young adults. It was quite a moving experience listening to Robert Watson articulate the shortcomings in provision and identify what's needed. And as Robert put it, respite is as close to a holiday, a break from the usual routine and stresses of everyday life as young men in his situation get. It should be a chance to socialise with people of a similar age and escape the isolation which comes with being at home most of the time. But it should also offer the families a break from the enormous caring responsibilities that they have and give them the chance to recharge their batteries, something they'll only really do if they're confident their loved one is somewhere they'll be able to fully enjoy. There are five calls to action contained within the muscular dystrophy, uh, dystrophy report. Give us a break. Reading through them in advance of this debate, I found myself nodding my head in agreement with each and every one. Uh, President officer, can I... Uh, conclude by, as Jim Eady did, pay tribute to John Miller, advocacy officer for Action Duchesne. 
John, as many members know, is a tireless campaigner for Action Duchesne, helped facilitate that meeting here in June, and members will not be surprised to learn was active in social media, encouraging, uh, encouraging attendance at tonight's event. John is a remarkable man, a force of nature, who has done incredible things to raise awareness of Duchesne's muscular dystrophy. As an MSP, his is the phone call or email you know there is no avoiding, because he will track you down eventually. As a whip in this Parliament, I wish my encouraging or imploring of back benches was half as effective as John's. In all seriousness, though, uh, important matters such as that before us this evening require people like John Miller campaigning on their behalf. So can I genuinely thank John, as well as those behind the muscular dystrophy and What About Us, ca us campaigns, for shining a light on this situation and finish by saying I look forward to hearing what the Minister has to say, especially after the way in which he's been buttered up all night. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call Siobhan McMahon to be followed by Chick Brodie. Thank you, President Officer. As a member of the cross-party group on palliative care, I am pleased to be able to take part in this evening's debate, and I thank my colleague Jackie Bailey for bringing this matter to the attention of the Chamber this evening. Being one of the last to contribute to the debate, I am sure that I will be repeating many of the key points many members have made in their speeches tonight. However, I wanted to be able to add my voice to those calling for a solution to the horrendous problem currently being experienced by those seeking palliative care when they transition from child to adult services. Having visited both Robin and Rachel House, I know of the tremendous work Chaz does, not only in supporting young people requiring their services, but also supporting their friends and family from the very first stages to the very last stages of their life, be that providing respite care, at-home care, spiritual care, and, of course, end-of-life care. It is a vital service and one that many, many people have benefited from over the last 21 years. As others have mentioned, Chaz currently supports 41 young people over the age of 21 and their families. That's 41 families and young people that wouldn't get the support they require if the charity decided they had to re remove the funding now. Where would those 41 young people go to? Who would care for them in the ways they require? Who would support them in the ways Chaz does now? Would they turn to their health board, their local authority, another charity? Or would they, as is often presumed, turn to another hospice. We all know that the current hospice provision in Scotland does not meet the demand of the parents currently requiring the service. I have had family members who have been fortunate to secure a bed at St Andrews Hospice in Airdrie at their time of need. I know firsthand how amazing the staff are at that hospice. They go out of their way not only to support your loved one, but also to make sure you have the support you need to make it through that day. I know that that hospice would love to provide the support to all of those who require it, but they just don't have the capacity to do so. Currently, they don't have the beds to support the demand on their services, and I'm sure that they are not the only hospice in Scotland facing this problem. That is the current situation. However, following Chaz's understandable decision to introduce their transitional policy, hospices like St Andrews will be required to help those currently being helped by Chaz. That would be helping young people, people of my age and lower, in a hospice not fit for their needs or their families' needs. Of course, if a bed couldn't be found for you, you would have to turn to your health board or a local authority. Who is going to fund this? Who is going to make sure that such services would meet all the needs of the young person and their families, as Chaz currently does? Members will know that I tabled a number of amendments to the Children and Young Persons Bill in relation to transition services. These amendments were primarily in relation to disabled young people and the issues they experience in their day-to-day -day lives. But the main aim of these amendments was to give support to disabled people and their families when they require it. It is a shame that the government could not back those amendments at that time. I am sure that the addition of the amendments to the bill would have made the situation of transition a lot better for disabled young people and would have played a part in addressing the concerns many have in relation to palliative care today. When writing this speech, I asked myself the simple question, would I be content or happy with the level of services offered if it was me or my fam family member? The answer was a resounding no. Therefore, I won't ask another family or young person to do what I wouldn't do. I urge the Minister to take on board the request in tonight's debate, listen to the request by Robert Watson, and to change the way we look at palliative care provision in Scotland for good. Thank you. Many thanks. And now call Chick Brodie. Thank you, President Officer. <coughs> uh, sometimes, as, as Graeme Day alluded to, we, we spend a lot of time talking about important things like the economy, and we've just had two years and a bit of that. But um, you know, one of these are important. We must never lose sight of the kind of society that we wish uh, to build, one that 
continues to have the foundation, I believe, of Scottish care, compassion and support. And I welcome the debate tonight because that brings us home. My name is uh, Charles, better known sometimes regrettably and historically, even hysterically, as Chick, but also known to some as CHAS, C-H-A-S. But that acronym has a greater connotation in terms of being uh, the Children's Hospice Association in Scotland. And living as I did in Milner Thought when I came back from Europe uh, in the mid-1990s, I was able on occasion to visit a Rachel House in Kinross. And these visits uh, put my focus on increased business turnover uh, and pristine balance sheets into its, their true perspective. These visits, these occasions, uh, never leave you. They never left me because they were indelibly etched into my brain, even my, my soul. And, and uh, Jackson Carlos' emotional and eloquent uh, uh, speech tonight indicates uh, how much these, uh, th 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 that affects us. And occasionally, too infrequently, they, they are brought to the surface, as it was when, uh, as Vice Convener of the Petitions Committee, uh, I was privileged to be there when we were challenged by an excellent uh, petition brought by Robert Watson on behalf of the Chas Young Adult Council. It drew on the experience and adequate provision uh, of the adequate provision in, uh, of respite care is essential to minimise the effects of illness and disability and so try and improve the quality of life of, for those with disabilities. And as uh, Robert presented, for young people over the age of 18, restricted to uh, 20, uh, 21, there may be very little uh, suitable uh, respite provision, nor was there the intended uh, consequential and needed break uh, for those uh, that look after uh, those with these disabilities. And this problem, in inverted commas, this problem, if it is a problem of creating suitable respite services for younger disabled adults with life-limiting conditions, arises partly because of medical advances. Medical problems, however, do not come with birthday cards or a timetable. The onset of a disease at a, a very early age uh, can transit from a very young child to a young adult age. And no one says at the age of 21 to the disease, stop. And yes, respite care in tandem with clinical care may be that bit more expensive for young adults and their carers, but with some ingenuity and the will across all NHS health boards and local authorities, we have to consider a reduction in the cost of the health service because respite actually provides a break for carers and, 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 re, and reduces their individual health dependency uh, on the NHS. And they do have a health dependency. Presiding officer, the Petitions Committee received a letter from an organisation uh, which shall remain nameless, but I, I, if I may just quote briefly. It said, the setting up of a res such a service, respite service, might have knock-on effects to existing respite services and make them unviable. And then it went on to talk about the expense. No mention of sociability or the frame or frames of reference of those young with time-life uh, disabilities or indeed that of the carers associated with them. Presiding officer, it is estimated the number of respite weeks provided in Scotland has increased by uh, 12,650 weeks, 7.3 per cent, between 2007-8 to 2012-13, and that's commendable. However, it is hoped that uh, effective provision of more respite care will be generated through the integration of health and social care. And that said, still, a sort of Damocles uh, hangs over the heads of those young people with life-limiting conditions. The, finally, presiding officer, the local authorities and the local NHS boards have, I believe, a responsibility to look at these services in the round and to consider what I believe are advantages advantageous benefits, yes, including cost benefits of the need and the demand for substantial respite care and service for those young adults. Thank you very much. Um, can I now call in the highly regarded Michael Matheson to respond to the debate, please, Minister, around seven minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, President Officer. Can I um, uh, begin by congratulating Jackie Bailey on securing time for uh, this important debate? And 
Um, I thought it's been a very interesting and also very thoughtful uh, debate and a number of the contributions. I also <clears throat> want to take this opportunity to uh, offer my thanks to Robert Watson uh, for submitting his, uh, his petition uh, to Parliament last uh, November and also for the work that's been undertaken by the Muscular Dystrophy Campaign. Uh, uh, give us a break uh, report and also the Action Duchenne uh, what about us uh, report as well. Can I, uh, sign officer, say that um, I fully recognise the important value uh, that respite breaks uh, provide to young people in particular, not just in providing a break for the people who uh, care for them uh, on a, a regular basis, but also the opportunity it gives them to socialise and to mix with individuals um, of their own age group. And they need to make sure that that can take place within an age-appropriate uh, setting. I should say um, that uh, providing this type of respite uh, for young disabled people uh, uh, across the country, um, uh, if I can just digress slightly, is not a new challenge. Uh, there has been a long-standing challenge in being able to provide good, high-quality respite for young people with disabilities uh, in a range of settings. For example, Red Cross House in Inverness had a traditionally very good reputation for providing that for individuals in, uh, in, uh, in the Highlands, which I have uh, experience of in my uh, previous role. There was also the Sue Ryder uh, uh, Centre, which was in West Lothian, which again provided very specialist care for young people with conditions such as MS, etc., um, who were not appropriate to go into a nursing home or a hospital uh, setting. Now, many of these facilities uh, don't exist now, and there continues to be a challenge in being able to uh, meet the necessary uh, uh, respite needs of young people with uh, a disability. But I do in particular uh, recognise uh, the important role uh, that such respite uh, can provide to those with life-limiting conditions, uh, such as uh, muscular uh, dy dystrophy. I think in uh, Jamidi's own contribution he highlighted the uh, important value that such respite provision can have, as did Jackson Carlaw in his own contribution um, as well. It made very clear about how important uh, young people uh, feel it can be. And that's why I think it's also about trying to make sure that we deliver respite to young people in the right way, because it's got to be person-centred, it's got to be safe and it's got to be effective. Uh, for them. And in order to achieve that, um, it's not simply a case of government deciding what should happen. It's about working with the right stakeholders in order to try uh, and achieve that. And that's something which I think it uh, requires some concerted effort. Uh, several members, uh, Nanette Millen and uh, Chick Brody, made uh, mention of this as well, is that uh, there is the opportunity that comes from the integration of health and social care uh, through the joint commissioning between local authorities and health boards and how they deliver services to make sure they're much more reflective uh, of the needs of their local community. And some of, the, uh, some of the joint work which will be taken forward in that area, I think, gives us an opportunity uh, to uh, achieve some greater joined-up working in this area as well. And I also want to mention uh, another option, which is there, of course, which is self-directed support, which gives people the opportunity to take forward uh, what is appropriate care for them in a manner which they feel is best suited. I want to turn back to the issue around the important value that many people have found from CHAS. And, uh, I, re I recognise, having uh, uh, visited uh, CHAS as well, um, it's uh, very much, as Jackie Bailey said, it's not a, a place which you go into which is mournful in any way whatsoever. It's a cheery place. It is a very empowering place. Uh, and it's empowering uh, for those who make use of its facilities. Uh, in itself and it's uh, an extremely rewarding place both for the individual and for uh, the families because of the fantastic level of uh, care which they provide there. And I understand and recognise the challenges which you now face as, uh, as uh, health care provision improves through uh, greater provision or improvements within uh, medication, health technology, which uh, provides us with a challenge with those whose life-limiting conditions are now living longer, a good challenge for us to have. Uh, but one which I recognise that we need to uh, face up to and address much more effectively. I want to turn to a couple of points, though. I think uh, 
And I'm sure no member would wish to give the impression that since the petition has been lodged, that the Scottish Government has not undertaken any work in this area in order to try and address this matter. And as the uh, Cabinet Secretary for Health, Alec Neill, uh, stated in his uh, letter to the Health and Sport Committee, uh, and has also stated in a letter to Jackie Bailey, there's a number of actions which have been taken forward. So, for example, um, officials have been gathering information from our Carers Information Strategy Legion NHS boards and our local authorities. Uh, and information which we have gathered there has indicated there are pockets of very good examples um, of work that's been undertaken, but it's also highlighted there are areas where there is a lack of consistency across the country and there are deficiencies as well. We've also uh, been working with CLOSA and we're gathering three key areas. Uh, we're now uh, quite advanced in this process around establishing Scottish data to determine the scale of the issue so we understand the numbers properly that we are talking about because I recognise it's a small number uh, but we need to make sure we understand that properly uh, around how we move forward. We're also mapping out uh, the breadth, capacity and the quality of existing services. So there is CHAS but there are other options and we need to look at those different models and we want to map those out effectively. And the other important piece of work which we're undertaking is analysing the economic evidence relating to running a bespoke service in its own. So there's a range of work which we are uh, taking uh, forward. Can I say though, presiding officer, and I've heard the comments and issues that have been raised by uh, members here tonight in what feels to me a level of frustration at what may appear as a, a lack of progress in getting action uh, to move forward on this issue. In the desire to try and be as helpful as I can, what I will undertake uh, to do is to convene a meeting with the interested parties to look at what we can do further in order to try and move this issue on to the next stage. Where that will take us to will be dependent upon some of the evidence and information which we have gathered uh, to date. But I hope that members will be reassured that the Cabinet Secretary has an interest in this matter. I have as well. But if it would offer them further reassurance, uh, and also to those who are listening in the gallery here tonight, I will convene a, a, speci a specific meeting in order to look at where we're at at the present point and to look at what further steps we need to take in order to drive this issue forward. Because I'm sure, uh, Sign Officer, it's in everyone's interest to make sure that those young disabled people within our communities receive the best support and the opportunity to lead as fulfilling and as full a life as possible. Thank you very much. Now that concludes Jackie Bailey's debate, absence of suitable hospice and respite facilities for young disabled adults. And I now close this meeting of Parliament. <laughs>